Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. It's Spencer here and I've just got a quick introduction before the interview here. Uh, it is with Dave Finberg from PeaksDigitalMarketing.com. They're a digital marketing agency. They do SEO for all types of clients, local clients, mostly small mom and pop businesses. And uh, the interview is actually with Jake Kane. He's pinch hitting for me here again. And so he's conducting the interview. You'll quickly see or hear him uh, in a second. Uh, but they go through and they talk about Dave's entire story, which is uh, pretty interesting because he's been building websites since he was in grade school. Uh, back to the dial up internet days is where he had his chance to build his first website. And then he quickly went on to building websites for family members and friends. And then that just kind of expanded into an entire career. And so I'll let him tell the story of how he went from, yeah, building websites for personal or family friends, uh, then to actually making real money in a job and now owning his own digital marketing agency. And so along the way, Dave is going to share some tips about uh, hiring and building a team and how he got his very first client and how he goes about getting clients now and what's working well there. Uh, but then also, so he's going to jump into some really great SEO strategies uh, to talk about everything from link building, content, page speed, and everything else that goes into digital marketing and SEO. And so uh, there's going to be some great takeaways here uh, for anybody from local businesses to small business owners, and certainly even for the affiliate marketers out there. He talks a lot about uh, different tools that he's using and some unique things in uh, SEM Rush and Ahrefs, um, some some little uh, strategies that he's using there that you can look at to analyze your site and make sure that you're doing your SEO properly. And so overall, hope that you enjoy this interview uh, with Dave Finberg. And if you want to follow along with what he's doing, again, you can find him at peaksdigitalmarketing.com. Thanks a lot. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Niche Pursuits podcast. My name is Jake Kane. I'm going to be hosting the podcast today. Really excited about our guest, uh, Dave Finberg, who's joining us. Dave, how are you doing today? Hey, doing well, Jake. Thanks for having me on. Very cool, man. Thanks for being here. So we're going to dive right in, Dave. I'll let you uh, kind of introduce yourself, if you wouldn't mind, to, to kick us off. Tell us a little bit about your background, you know, personally, professionally, whatever you want to cover, and then um, what your what your business is and kind of what you're into these days. Perfect. So, uh, you know, got started in this industry, um, you know, building websites for friends and family, uh, GeoCities, Angel Fire, you know, the the dial up days, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and, you know, today, you know, I run Peaks Digital Marketing, um, the CEO, basically, and we we offer websites, content um, and high level SEO, you know, on page link building kind of the whole gambit of classic services. I'm okay. um, the small, medium and enterprise businesses. Um, so a lot of my background is, you know, in content, it's in strategy, it's in, you know, actually being uh, a former mechanic, which, uh, you know, many people don't know, I used to be a, a master Mercedes mechanic, I'm very oh, wow. much a technician at heart. And, yeah. you know, over the last seven years, we've, we've been building out peaks and, you know, becoming, uh, you know, kind of shifting into more of a managerial role, but my background is is heavily in in the process and in the the facilitation of the SEO. So, um, you know, whether it's SEO, AdWords, or websites uh, or analytics, you know, I, I'd say those would be probably my my core kind of core competencies. Uh, but yeah, got got started on you know the twenty eight eight modem dial up days, making websites for my grandfather and for friends and family, and uh, wow. you know, had a lot of fun. That's crazy, man. That's. Uh... That's pretty awesome. So why don't you talk a little bit about the, um, I think I read in your bio that you built your first website at age nine or something like that. Uh, talk to us about the old days of the internet, man. There's probably people that are listening to this right now that think you're speaking a foreign language here talking about dial up internet. Uh, what, what were some of the, uh, like what, when you were a kid or however old, like what got you started? Like, how did you even know this was a thing? Like, what were some of your first websites? Like what was how did it get going? It was funny. Uh, you know, my dad introduced me to computers at like around age six or seven. Um, and, and fortunately for, for me, he was, you know, 
very much a, a techie kind of engineer kind of mindset. So he went out and we had a computer that we bought at the store. And at first he didn't have internet, right? It was just the computer and just yeah. word and maybe a couple of games. Right. So, um, you know, over time we, we ended up, you know, he said, Hey, we, we have this thing called the internet now and we're getting it and here's what it is. And, you know, you can go and make websites and around, you know, year after that, when, uh, I was, I was like in grade school. It was pretty crazy that to think that grade school was like teaching kids how to code. There's actually a web development, kind of like an after school program where you would make a website. And so to, to the people that don't know about dial up or don't have a, a recollection of, of what websites looked like back then, it was literally uh, very simple, right? It, it was a background, you know, maybe a couple of pictures, a couple of animations, or they called them gifs at the time, right? These little kind of, yeah. uh, story reels that you could put on and kind of kind of like what you you send in a text message now right like that was your right. website and um you know so i started building websites and they had these free sites that you could go and you could set up your own website and it it was very you know uh very easy to get started and low friction right so you'd go you'd pick your url out and it'd be like angel fire backslash you know hobbies backslash cars and people would just almost like a social media profile, just post things that they wanted to share with, with other people and have it accessible through the internet, just to be able to like type it in and say, whoa, like, oh, you yeah. can, we can share this experience. So um, my grandfather was like, oh, I heard you build websites. And he's like, I he used to own some restaurants. And he was a chef and he, he wanted a website uh, that kind of highlighted his, uh, his story and had some, you know, just basic kind of uh, photos and talking points, um, and effectively what that turned into was, you know, me building websites for, um, all kinds of, you know, friends, family, I started building, uh, they used to have this service called flash that the internet kind of graduated into, into more of a, um, you know, uh, interactive, better quality websites, right. More animations and games. And so, you know, there are these different platforms that you would use back, back then before it was WordPress or before it was magento or html5 you just had html and right you'd go in you'd code in your your text and you'd put a hyperlink in there it was very crude it did not look you know if yeah. you looked at it now you'd you'd probably gag just looking at it kind of thing but it was a uh, still the basics of how the web works today which is pretty interesting okay so you got your start then building websites for other people so people were just like you were like the website guy and people were coming to you and are they just paying you to build a website? Were you doing this all for free? Like is building websites for others sort of how you made that first dollar online? Is that what got you started? Yeah, exactly. I was doing it for fun. And, uh, you know, my grandfather's like, no, I'm going to pay you 20 bucks for this. And I'm thinking 20 bucks, you know, as a nine-year-old, you're like, that's a lot of candy or whatever it is, right. That you're buying. So, um, you know, I was like, whoa. And then, you know, my aunt ended up, having her own business and wanted a, a website for her candle business. And next thing you know, you know, there's a couple freebies in there too. At the first dollar made was, um, was through my grandfather. It was, it was 20 bucks. I'll, I'll remember it like it was yesterday. I thought I had hit the lotto. It was funny. Oh, um, yeah. And it was a blast and he really enjoyed it. He had something called web TV, which probably no one here knows about, or maybe a few have heard about but you could actually browse the web from your television. And all he wanted to do was just be able to log in and show his friends and, you know, colleagues, like what, what his website was about, which was, uh, yeah. it was cool to share. That's awesome, man. So, so what was the, um, sort of the, the evolution from there? I mean, you, you built some websites, people were giving you, sounds like a little bit of, a little bit of money, you know, you're a kid, right? So it's a lot of money as a kid, but as you get up teenager, graduating high school, I don't know if you went to college or what, but sort of like, how did you go from building websites for grandpa and friends and family to, I guess, more, more serious business, if you will. So, so the next step, um, it was more of a personal step, right? It was creating a flash website I actually went, you know, back then they had different forms and places you could go to collaborate with people and learn things just like they do today. So, um, I, I met a mentor, uh, kind of like a virtual mentor, so to speak, that taught me how to um, code websites in in different platforms and make more advanced websites. And so one of them was like, I don't know, delirium2002.com or something like that, right? They're, they're, these were kind of just 
art pieces, right. That I was putting out there and uh, you know, they'd have music and I'd really just try to push the envelope on like what a website could be. And you know, that later evolved into um, just kind of fast forwarding through, through, you know, some of the professional experience and then, you know, work obviously. And then I actually was a mechanic for a while. Right. So I, I learned quite a bit about cars and computers and what the process was in terms of like fixing something and having, having kind of like a technical guide of, of, you know, how to, to create a content and experiment and really get, get down to the, to the nitty gritty of, of actually doing the work. And uh, I had a friend um, who they owned an SEO company and they said, Hey, why don't you come um, intern for us? Like, you know, it was clear at that point in time, you know, I was actually studying to be a network security expert, right? So more of like a, an ethical certified ethical hackers, kind of what they call it. Um, and it was, it kind of took me off guard in the sense that I never really considered like what my strengths were. They're, they're technical. There's also a lot of content, right. And writing and creativity that, you know, I was making these art pieces as a child. Right. And so thinking about it from that perspective, I thought, well, this seems like a, like a perfect fit. It's a little bit of technical, it's a little bit of creativity, um, so I took on a, a content manager position at a company uh, out in DC, which is kind of the area that I'm originally from, uh, and basically got to work cranking out like one or 200 articles a month on anything from sports to um, virtual office space, right? We just had this kind of gambit of clients. And so it was a yeah. really great opportunity to learn more about what SEO was, be able to leverage some some of the, the skill set that, that I inherently have and also get an opportunity to be part of a team. And so what that, that kind of evolved into was company grew. Um, I ended up becoming, you know, full-time with that organization, managing the entire digital department, learning more about what goes into SEO. And at that time, the company that, you know, the company's model wasn't nearly what SEO is today. Back then people were doing what they call private blog networks. And you'll still hear some of that in, in yeah. today's world. It's just not, in my opinion, the, uh, more innovative approach to SEO. Yeah. So, you know, I got to learn about what worked, what didn't work, what kind of goes into a campaign, how to set up the analytics and the tracking. And, you know, it got to this point where uh, the company was making money. We just weren't keeping it. And, and no one was, you know, really at a, at a level of, of, you know, I, I like to take responsibility and accountability and everything that I do. So I don't want to make this sound like it's just management or it's just the C-level exec. So at some level, the money was not being managed properly and individuals were, you know, having trouble getting paid and it just didn't make sense. It's like, wow, yeah. as a company, we're making, you know, close to seven figures and no one's getting like a consistent paycheck and like we're paying yeah. so-and-so's mom's rent, but like, what about our web developer? And like, what right. about these other people that are actually working? Yeah. Right. And so uh, the company in short disbanded and that's where I came up with the idea for peaks, which was, um, you know, having an opportunity to make an agency that, that, you know, creates a great community for our employees, creates a great experience for clients. Um, and there were a few things that I learned in that, in that journey of, of kind of growing into more of a managerial role coming up from, from kind of the content role, obviously having some background helped, right. Knowing how to work a website, knowing how to edit code and, yeah. you know, facilitate, um, that that was really kind of the turning point and, and a, a, a turning point is kind of like a fork in the road that I wasn't expecting. Like I thought the company was, was going to continue growing. I thought we were going to see continued success and that we were going to overcome, um, our hurdles in the infancy of this company. And, it was kind of a slap in the face or punch to the gut, right? When that, when that opportunity um, no longer made sense and didn't work out. And so, yeah. you know, the decision at that point was, well, you know, clearly we've had some great success. I was interested in it. I found myself doing it just like, uh, you know, engaging in SEO and thinking about it all the time, just like I was, you know, earlier in my youth, like staying up all night, creating a website. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, well, why can't I do this, you know, and create a, a new experience and, that was when I decided that uh, I was going to move out to Colorado. We, um, I came up with the brand name peaks, digital marketing, reach your summit, like start putting together some of the pieces, mm -hmm. um, and made a game plan. It wasn't immediate. It wasn't, you know, you, everyone starts in the same place, right. With zero clients usually. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had to take on a job. I took back on a mechanic job, which I thought I was never going to have to do again. I thought I'd close that door, you know, half a decade prior. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, while I was doing that, when the shop was slow, I was making my website and trying to work, you know, work on a client list and just can kind of continue through that process. And, yeah. 
Um, that's, that's really the, the short summary of like how, <laughs> how it started versus, you know, where it began. Yeah. That's pretty wild, man. Uh, so yeah. what year is this then that you were kicking off the, uh, your own agency roughly? Like what's the timeline on that? It was uh, about November 2014. So sure. the the gig at the previous marketing company, I shouldn't say gig, but the the company disbanded more around maybe October 2014. Yeah. November came up with the logo, came up with the branding, right, and some of the taglines. And by January, I say like 2015, things yeah. you know we had a website. We we're actually ready to do business. Um, yeah. Which yeah. So what did you do then in the early days? So you're. Uh back to being a mechanic, you're sort of doing this, you know, moonlighting, which I think a lot of people listening can relate with. Um, a lot of people that that was me years ago, you know, working a nine to five job and then doing this stuff at night, hoping that one day you can quit your job and, you know, work from anywhere and that whole thing and kind of live uh, the dream, so to speak. Uh, but in your case, when you were doing that, I mean, what was, how did you get your first clients? Like what, <laughs> were you calling people that you'd worked with in the past? Were you like, what were you doing? Like, how did how did you start getting work and how did it, how did you get some momentum? You know, there, there are a few things that, that I did at the beginning, you know, the first, just the, the kind of context of this was, I really was not in a good position with my nine to five. I was making money. It wasn't consistent. I, I was, you know, basically a, a, a new guy in a, in a town that I'd never been right. And like in the shop with, with people that, um, for whatever reason, just, it wasn't a warm environment, right? It was just kind of like showing up, making your money, go home. Yep. And so it was, it was kind of a traumatic experience in the sense that like two months earlier, I was, you know, managing a digital agency. Now it almost felt like I was taking a step back and in an environment where there's some adversity there. So I was very motivated, very, very motivated to yep. take some action and make, try to make something happen for myself. Um, and you know, I did reach out to old clients, um, over the course of the following year, that kind of took some time to come to fruition. It did come back around and some of the people that, I'd, you know, managed at the other agency coming on board, which was a great win. Um, I was literally printing out flyers, dropping them off at businesses. I was asking people in my apartment building for referrals and for, you know, Hey, are you guys looking for someone that can help you with your digital campaigns? I'll do any, you know, you need your social, your website. Like at that point, I wasn't saying no to anything. Right. right. And I had a guy in my building, uh, who wanted to create a website, right. That, you know, it's like, I got 500 bucks. I need a site. It's like, let's do it. Right. Like you're, you're not thinking <laughs> about anything other than like, let's get a couple people in the door. And now looking back, it's like, you know, a website for $500 is it's like masochism, right? But like, <laughs> yeah, at that point it was, it was like, let's get yeah. this started. So I got a laptop. Like I, I didn't have, I was pretty much broke. I yeah. wasn't broke in the sense that I wasn't making rent or didn't have a place to stay or didn't have a car, or didn't have a job. It was every money, every dollar that I made like went towards something. And there wasn't much, you know, maybe a hundred, 200 bucks a month that I had that I could spend on other stuff. So I went to a, a pawn shop. I found the best laptop I could, right? I went to like seven pawn shops. Yeah. Um, and I was just looking at it as an opportunity to say like, Hey, I, I'm confident. I know I can add some value. Let's like, whether you need a, a basic website or you need something more comprehensive, like I can help. And eventually what happened is one of my neighbors worked at a uh, software company and it was a smaller kind of family owned business. And they'd mentioned, hey, we really need a digital person to help with AdWords and with paid ads. And they they had gone through some algorithm updates. They were spending a ton of money on AdWords, not getting results. And, you know, I made sure that the price was right. Uh, you know, it was like a $2,000 a month starting contract. So still not enough to live off of, but enough to to really get a nice chunk of the business going. And yeah, um, I just kept working, working that deal to the point where they really had more work than than we were solving within that budget. So we were able to increase that budget. And that's where I really made the transition. And from there, right, you get a couple of old clients, right? You, you keep working your leads and you, you reach out to friends, to family, to colleagues, to, I mean, I was just doing anything that I could in the sense of like warm leads. I wasn't just, you know, I mentioned I was dropping flyers off. That really didn't work, right? Uh, one thing that I did that worked was I started a mastermind on meetup.com. Okay. Right, just becoming a thought leader, a source of water for people in the desert and uh, trying to 
establish myself in a community where it might not be the person attending your mastermind. It could be someone that they know or, right? Obviously yeah. referrals start coming in as, as business starts to build, but from square one, that was really what it looked like. Yeah. Very cool. So on that last note there with meetup, like how did that, how'd you start getting traction with that? Like how did people find out about it? I mean, it sounds like maybe it worked. Did you find clients by doing that? I, I found one very solid client. Uh, a lot of it was, you know, it, it gave me some confidence to, to continue going. I had people in those courses and they would say, you know, just to maybe back up, right? Like the, the course itself, I, I created a meetup group all about SEO, all about helping small businesses. And yeah. I was giving away tips and tricks, right? Which is what a lot of people do. Right. And it's effective, right? People need help and you can give them a, an effective tool and tip or trick, right? That's always good. Yeah. So it, it was just leading with value, which is something that I, you know, I think every, every great business person does today. So leading with that value and, and saying, Hey, you know, we're going to put on a, 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 I put like a lot of detail into the post. Like, here's all the things you're going to get. And we, I used to do a couple of Kickstarter campaigns or in the past, I'd done a couple of Kickstarter campaigns. And the number one thing that people have reservations about when they're like opting into something is like, am I going to really get any value? Are they going to do what they say they're going to do? So yeah. trying to make it extremely concise and clear, but still having like brevity to it, but actually giving them like everything we were going to go over. So I turned it into almost like a little mastermind. Right. Yeah. And I, I picked the restaurant, you know, right down the street from my, from my apartment and uh, reserve a table with the, with the hostess there and bring a bunch of people and we'd get some food and like I invested a good bit into getting people to see the value. And some people literally would just come and eat the food. And I'm like, why are you here? And they're like, Oh, you know, I thought it was cool. You know? And you're like, it was a little, yeah. And I was like kind of pissed. I'm like, what? Like, you're just here to eat the food. Yeah. Like, a lot of people would come up to me. Like I'd say out of 10 people, like four after the event would come up to me. Like that was so valuable. Thank you so much. By the way, like let's grab emails. Let's stay in contact. And then out of that, you know, one or two clients out of that one specific one was like a local business that, you know, someone just came looking for strategies, looking for value. And so yeah, um, that was like, I think that's the magnet for people to really take away is, you know, just add value, add value, add value, find the things yeah. that people want to know. Like people want to know how to optimize their blog or what, what is the right way to write a meta title or description? Right. And like, even though these are objective things and a lot of it's just classic SEO at the other end, like, you know, it's, it's super valuable. What you might think is basic to someone else is, is going to be immensely, you know, powerful to them and, and might be part of the foundation that gets them where they want to go. So, yeah. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that was the meetup, uh, kind of exercise. And we did probably four or five meetups and had some, you know, some really good talks and some conversations. And it just gave me like this perception of, um, of myself, of, of being an expert, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with at first is like the imposter syndrome and the confidence of asking someone for the sale. And maybe you don't know exactly how you're going to do it. Maybe you have a good right. idea. Mm -hmm. So you know, being able to take that leap of faith was, was something that I walked away with, with more ability to do as a result of, of some of those meetups and got a little bit of business, which was great. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great point. Uh, I would say um, to that, I, I remember feeling a lot of those, those same thoughts when I first started working with Spencer on niche pursuits and just writing, you just feel just like you said, kind of that imposter syndrome, but you forget that you know, I would say somebody that's a regular just niche pursuits reader and listens to the podcast, like you probably know more about SEO than 98% of the people that you come in contact with, you know, people that are running local businesses and stuff like that, that, you know, they're running their business. They, that's not their thing. And, and you're exactly right. You think, you know, I don't know, I don't have some big special knowledge, but a lot of times what you know <laughs> can help a lot of people, you know, and that's pretty cool, man. So you started leveraging that out then and, and start, it sounds like building up a little bit of a client base. How long did it take before you were able to step away from your job as a mechanic and sort of be all in on your agency? And what does it look like today? I mean, it's, it looks like you've got a team in place. And I mean, what, what kind of clients are you working with? Like, how, how's it going now in 2021? Uh, that's, that's great. Yeah. So, so kind of pivoted about six months into, um, into things that I made the transition to, you know, really try to upsell my, my clients. They came to me saying like, Hey, can you do more? It was almost like just perfect timing. Yeah. Um, and you know, obviously people see your passion, they see like what you've started to do and they, they want to see what else you can do. So, 
you know, it took another, I would say year, year and a half to really build up, um, enough client base to have enough resources to start hiring. So where I, where it kind of started was internships, right? Like going to Boulder CU at the time I lived in Boulder, Colorado, um, you know, going to see you and finding like a, a web developer or someone in, you know, that can help with some of the design and graphics and things that people, you know, ultimately were asking me a lot for. So, you know, trying to be resourceful was, was really like the first year, year and a half, once it kind of converted to full time. Um, you know, today we work with over 25 clients in niches from finance to uh, medical SEO to info, uh, you know, like courses and, you know, I don't want to say infotainment, but like, you know, educational courses and materials, um, in addition to some home services, local mom and pops. I mean, there's, there's a few niches where we kind of say, Hey, like if it's a great business and, and we can get excited about it, like the SEO is, 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 uh, I don't want to say standardized that the process was relatively the same. It's more about just understanding the nuances of the niche. Yeah. Uh, but today, you know, we're working with anything from, from local businesses who, you know, want to take over the Denver area or, maybe another area, Los Angeles, DC, you know, kind of nationwide, so to speak. And then yeah. uh, all the way up to enterprise where they're thinking about, you know, international SEO and how we can roll out and impact uh, websites that, you know, are part of different subdomains and really standardize more of the process. And at that level, it's like a bigger boat with a smaller rudder. And so uh, the, our bread and butter is really small and medium sized businesses um, in, in the past couple of years, we've gotten more into the enterprise side of things, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. There's a full team here. We've got web developers, content experts, you know, on page experts, you know, backlink outreach. It's, it's really turned into, uh, into this team that, that, you know, it has, it actually kind of reminds me of a point, which was at the beginning, I thought I was almost better off being a solo printer, especially yeah. when you're in that first kind of initial tranche, right? Cause you're right. making, you're making actually more money than you have. You get to this level where you're like, Oh, now I have a couple, two, three, four clients and you're very busy, right? Things are progressing at a rate where life feels good. It's just a little hectic. Yeah. <laughs> and you're thinking, okay, like, wow, I, I could get used to this salary. I could get used to this paycheck every month. Right. And then, you know, it was really with, um, I have a couple of mentors and people that were like, dude, you need to take this up to the next level. Like you need to start hiring a team and you really need to start taking the steps to, to turn this into something that you can scale out across the nation or the world, you know, what's your yeah. dream? Like start taking yeah. some more steps. And in that process was, was a, another challenge. It was like, I was more of a technician. I was used to doing it on my own. I was used to not asking for help or having limited amounts of help and really being more of the, the uh, wizard of Oz man behind the curtain, pulling the levers. Right. And right. Um, so to, you know, over the last, I would say three to four years, it's really evolved in, in the sense of um, not only has the business evolved, not only has the client base evolved, my evolution as a leader and has evolved and doing things. I really, you know, the nature of a mechanic is to be by yourself and to just work with the car, just work with the website, right. In the case sure. of an SEO. And, um, you know, that's, that's been kind of a milestone in, in the sense of, of building this team and, and watching it grow and watching people contribute their own artwork, right. And doing things that like inherently I would have never thought of and seeing just the, the level of collaboration and watching the culture evolve is it's been super rewarding. If you had told me, you know, six and a half years ago that, that, you know, it, it was going to look like it did. I, I, I would have called, called myself crazy. Right. But then on the other end, it's, uh, it, it's kind of exceeded my expectations in, in other ways. That's, that's, uh, it just made like a, a lasting impact in how I approach every, every part of my life now, which is pretty cool. That's awesome, man. When you, uh, when you first brought, like, who was the first person you brought on to help? And when you did it, were you just immediately like, why didn't I do this sooner? Or did it take a while to get in the groove a little bit? And sort of, I feel like a lot of people have a, a hard time handing stuff off because maybe you're a little bit of a perfectionist or you're worried that they're not going to care about it as much as I do or do it as well as I do. Like, did you have any, any of that going on or was it pretty easy? And you're like, oh yeah, this is, this is great. Like right from the outset. No. Yeah. It, there was a lot of that, you know, I'm a perfectionist by, by nature. And that's, I guess you've really kind of touched on that's kind of what I've, I've changed over the last last like this journey of season of business has been 
not being, not seeing that as the solution at first, the, the way that looked like it was kind of like a sine wave, right? Like you had these ups and these downs. So at first it was like, Oh, this is great. We're getting a lot more throughput. We're I'm getting some feedback on what I can do to make the processes better or to have, Hey, we need to ask the client for this next time we're doing this. Right. And just kind of working through the checklist and the day to day and where it started to um, unravel was like, you know, you're sending someone a job and they're, you think it takes, you know, X amount of time and it really takes Z amount of time or right. There'd be like these challenges where they become almost more interpersonal than they do technical. And they're like, well, why are you sending me this? And I'm like, well, I thought we we're doing the web mock-up and they're like, we have no brand guidelines. I'm like, what's that? You know, you're like <laughs> learning through it. Right? right. And so now it's like, oh, I know. Okay. I knew what brand guidelines. Are. I just didn't know what that entailed. It's your fonts and your colors. Okay, cool. Right. So there yeah. was a lot of, uh, especially when you're, you're having um, the, you know, it was kind of a gift, right. Of being able to find someone that has these technical skills at an intern level that can help. And then inherently, right. My, the, the people that I'm training are younger people and have different perspectives. And it was awesome to see them collaborate and add, you know, uh, my, my first role was a web developer, also a designer, which is actually pretty rare. Like most developers aren't designers and vice versa. And so she was really kind of a, 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 a double, you know, you call them like triple threat, like act dancing, right? She could like design, develop and do branding, which was really remarkable. So we were able to come up with, it really helped me come up with some great um, value ads for clients and really understand more of like what goes into typography and like more of the traditional kind of web design classic web design principles that I didn't learn in school. Mm -hmm. um, on the reverse end, right? It, there was there was this kind of frustration when you think you've sent someone off to something, you think it's clear, and then you're in a meeting and they're pinging you like ticked off that you didn't give them what you need or just frustrated. I wouldn't say necessarily ticked off. It's like, yeah. hey, where are you? I need my stuff. And you're like, whoa, now I'm dealing with two things at once. And now I'm, maybe it's taking some of my attention away from the client. And it's yeah. It becomes like a muscle, like you're trying to work this muscle that you haven't worked out as much, or at least in my case, right? I hadn't worked out sure. as much. So, so uh, um, real quick, I want to get into um, some SEO specifics, you know, and some of the things that you've learned and things that you see that are working well and have worked well over the years. And before I do that, I want to ask you real quick, you mentioned um, internships, and I thought that was interesting. I'm just kind of curious, are you still hiring interns? That's something I've, I've heard about and I like, casually looked into. Um, I've heard that it's a good way to find talented people and not pay, you know, an extreme rate that you might have to pay somebody that's more experienced. So I would imagine somebody that's maybe running some websites and or doing a startup or something like that, that that could be an attractive option. Was that something that uh, sounds like it worked out well for you? But like, how did you even uh, begin? Like, how did you look for interns? How did you know what to pay them? Like that whole thing? Like, did you use a service? What did you do there? So, so we always did paid internships and we tried to, to pay people more than what they would be paid somewhere else. So like a lot of internships would be like minimum wage. Right. And we would try to differentiate ourselves of like, Hey, we expect a lot for this position, but we, we see the value. There's opportunities to visit, pivot into a full-time or a part-time role right after this. Right. And so it's really okay. just kind of like being transparent, honest. Also, you know, the way of starting that was, to answer your other question was looking at like, there's actually specific ways that you need to post internships for certain colleges. Right. And so it usually involves going, reaching out to like, I think I just reached out to someone at Boulder CU and I was like, Hey, how do I get an internship? Like on your guys' platform, I'd love to, you know, give, give back and get, you know, get back to, right. And so yeah. like, we need some help and this would be a great opportunity for someone. So Kind of like leading with value again of like, hey, we're we're gonna train you, you're gonna learn all this stuff, you're also gonna be paid. It's gonna be better than this other internship is gonna pay you twelve fifty an hour or whatever it is, ten dollars an hour. Yeah. Um, and there's room to grow. And so that was that was like what gets people thinking about, ooh, right? From there, it's really it's really um when the dust settles, looking at the people that are actually have that potential. And it's not always obvious. Like some people, it's skills, like in the case of our first web developer, Hannah, it was skills, right? Like she is in this, this track of like web designer branding development. And so it was, you know, very easy to say perfect. Right. 
Yeah. It doesn't always come like that. And so what I've seen is that, you know, there are people that are hungry that really want to learn that um, not only, you know, want to learn that or want to add value. And it's finding those people that, that have um, that kind of mindset that is really what you need in a startup. Cause you can have someone that has the perfect skill set and like can't thrive working on two projects or three projects at once. Right. Or can't thrive in an environment where, the answer isn't always there. It's like, not like school, like school. It's like, just look in your textbook. It's right here. Right. And a startup, you're like, <laughs> I'm still making the process. Like, I don't even have this ready for you, but let's start building it and building the plane as we take off. And so yeah. finding those kind of, uh, I think cultural fit is, is innately important. You have to have cultural fit. And if you can find skills, great. And just go to your co- like local colleges, places that, that, you know, have good programs and start looking for people in these specific programs. They have web development, almost I'm sure every university now has these, these kinds of, of, of tracks for, for students. So, um, and differentiate yourself, right? Like try to get the best of the best and give them a, give them a fair shot and give them some opportunities that maybe they wouldn't get anywhere else or some culture that they wouldn't get anywhere else or an experience that they wouldn't get anywhere else. And you'll find that, that many of those people will, will stay for long, long periods of time. Very cool, man. That's awesome. Um, cool. Well, let's talk a little bit then about, we'll dig into SEO. Um, and I want to talk about uh, a few things and then, you know, just sort of what you what you see that's working uh, for clients. Obviously, you've been at this a very long time, but I'm assuming that when you get a new client, even now when you have these discussions, uh, people don't come to you saying, hey, we want to try to get to page three of Google, right? Everybody wants to be number one for whatever it is, if it's a local business, that sort of thing. So uh, talk us through that. I know I read in your bio, you know, you talk a little bit about SEO roadmaps, uh, different strategies for getting to page one. I mean, I know that's a big topic, but, you know, when you start having this discussion with a client and I would say, you know, that a lot of the folks listening to us, the niche pursuits audience is a lot of solopreneurs, people that are building up uh, websites in the, you know, the affiliate marketing space, maybe some e-commerce, maybe some digital advertising, you know, and I know Spencer always talks a lot about keyword research and things like that. Um, so I think that that's a lot of the audience that you're listening to maybe probably don't have a big team. It's not a big local business. It's kind of the one man show. So with that in mind, I mean, where do you, where do you start that conversation when we talk about, Hey guys, how are, how are we getting to page one of Google? I'm going to try to give you guys the, the, the full playbook here and really like lean into the value. So what, what I typically tell clients and what I, I tell to just anyone that wants to learn about SEO is there's about six to seven core areas, right? You've got your on-page, you've got backlinks, you've got citations, you've got, um, you know, your content, you've got your web experience. You've also got your page speed and more of like the technicals behind like how the site is being rendered and how it loads. You've got reputation, right? And so it used to be, you know, and, and this is maybe dates me a bit, but it used to be, you didn't need all these. You just need like great backlinks and great on-page or like, really good backlinks and like good page speed. Right. And it's, it's no longer, especially in these more competitive, you know, markets, like if you're pursuing something that, that, you know, you're, you're trying to generate revenue and likely 18 other people are doing the same thing. And so you know, what we look at are these seven to eight different core areas. And that's where the roadmap begins. Like you need keywords, you need all of these, you know, classic SEO titles, tags, keywords. Um, on the other end, it's really like doing a SWOT analysis on like, what is the experience of your site? Is my page speed great, right? We have the core web vitals update coming out in June. We've got other page speed updates and, and places that say, hey, if your site loads in under four seconds, your conversion rate doubles or triples, especially for e-commerce stores, right? And so what's your checkout process like? What, what pages are loading fast? What aren't? Like, what are we starting with so we can actually map out the right plan of attack as opposed to just doing what everyone else does with just keywords and backlinks, right? Or on page. So it's real understanding, okay, what are we strong in? Do we have good page speed? How's our content? Do we have the right LSI keywords? Do we have the supporting information and FAQs and like comprehensively covering our topic in depth at scale, right? Or maybe not at scale, but just done done correctly and scaling it, you know, the right way. And so that's really where I start with is like, what's the content look like? What's the website look like? How's the speed of the site? Are there calls to action? Is it optimized for conversions, right? Do we have the right foundation and like bones in place so that when we drive traffic, it doesn't just leak out the bottom of the bucket, right? right. 
from there, um, it is so much strategy, right? And what I see oftentimes with the more classic stuff like keywords, right? It's everyone knows the obvious keywords, but they don't know the low hanging fruit or the synonyms or terms that people aren't bidding on yet. And yeah. for sometimes there's good reason, like sometimes those terms aren't as high converting. Other times it's just hidden gems or fruit that people haven't done. They didn't spend, they spent an hour in SEM rush instead of three hours, right? They looked at two competitor websites instead of every competitor in the niches website in different locations and really understanding like every single opportunity that's available. And so strategy is by far most important site map strategy, combining the two, right. Creating the right content, creating the right experience for the user, understanding what those expectations are on what a page should look like for these terms. Mm -hmm. Right. And then ensuring that the technical and the speed is up to date. And like, you're not starting behind the finish line because your site speed is 10 seconds or when the industry standard is five or whatever it is. Right. So those are, those are like kind of the, the first, I say non-negotiables of any successful campaign and yeah. your tools like SEM rush, HRFs, everyone probably knows about these, these tools already. For those of you who don't, these tools can help you write the content and understand what the LSI terms are and really start to take a look at like what, what needs to be on this page. I also do a bit just classic marketing, like what um, I should say the team, right? What we, what we do is, you know, we look at these pages and we identify like, what is, well, let's do a SWOT analysis on everyone else's page. And let's start to make a wish list of like, if we were to create this experience, what would we want to see? And what would a user want to see? And so now we're thinking of things, not in terms of, of copying. And I think there's a, a big misnomer that you just copy what everyone else is doing. I think that's, it's a low hanging fruit for people. It's not always what's going to get you to the finish line. It's something that you can take inspiration from it. You should be trying to do it better than everyone else, right? You should yeah. be trying to create something. If you want, you know, the page one is a statistical outlier. 90% of websites will never hit the first page. It's, it's stats are out there, right? So like what's at stake is um, like the expectation should be that it's going to be hard and that you're really going to need to excel in all of these areas to give yourself the best shot of hitting number one or page one or top three or whatever it is. And so, uh, very cool, Dave. So talk to me then, um, maybe if you have an example, and I don't know if you can share like an actual client example, but I heard you talk about um, under content strategy, using a tool like an SEM rush um, to take a look at a competitor. And I'm assuming you're talking about, you know, keyword research and some of the low hanging fruit. You mentioned LSI keywords, but do you have um, just a success story that comes to mind that you could share? Or, you know, you could even talk hypothetical, but just kind of explaining how that might work, you know, taking a topic or whatever and sort of redoing a piece of content or if it's a new piece of content and kind of how you would do that. Like, what, where would you start? You, you hop into SEM Rush. Um, where do you go from there? So, so when you hop in SEM Rush, there's a tab called on page SEO checker. And what you'll do is you'll put in your landing pages. And, you know, once you've done the keyword research or at least have some bones around the keyword research, you'll pop those keywords into the on page SEO checker. It will actually give you, um, it'll check the top 10 pages in um, in the search results and tell you kind of what they're talking about. And so they'll identify terms. They'll say, hey, semantically, you need to be talking about, like, let's say it's like a personal injury lawyer, or whatever it is, you know, you need to be talking about um, trial and case. And you're not talking, you don't have the these terms in your content or um, it could be a variety of different kind of like, you're basically yeah. taking a big topic and breaking it into smaller chunks, right? And so yeah. there's usually a few chunks that are missing. And what this on-page SEO tool will help you uncover are um, different kind of like LSI terms or different terms that it's, it's, it's expecting to see, right? They're expecting to see settlement and court and injury and these different things, right? And maybe we talk about that, but there's usually a few that that always just kind of miss the list. And so th- this SEM Rush on-page SEO idea tool will actually help you uncover some of those opportunities without having to manually go through each and every site and like visually compare. What I actually would recommend starting with is I think at the top five questions and the, the, the pain points, like going back more to traditional marketing of like SEO is the icing on the cake. You need great content and you really need to understand where your clients pain points and needs are and how your product or service empowers them to meet or exceed their expectations around these needs. Right. And so 
it is so much the keywords, right? We need all these things that that's the icing on the cake. That's not the cake. Right. And so in, in the context of providing value, really just focusing on what are those five things that, you know, everyone asks you about this, what are the reservations that you or, or someone in your industry might have about utilizing a product or service like this? Like start with the meat of it, just go straight in for what you already know people want to know. And from there, you can go in and add an LSI terms and un uncover different topics. Another thing that I like to do is we call a content gap analysis where we're actually analyzing like what are the headings and the topics? Like we'll go through 10 articles and really uncover like what are the, the things that people are talking about here? And, and instead of just taking that at face value, let's go research those topics and figure out truly like how we can create an exceptional piece of content around it. And then from there, we can add in the keywords, the headings, the LSI terms, right? So it's it's very much in the planning stage, right? Where maybe you already have a page, that's great. We can build upon that, right? It's always great to update and improve existing content. It helps with your SEO, it helps with your impressions. It's Google will automatically start split testing your new content and identifying that you have these new terms as it recrawls your website. Um, on the other end, right, we're, we're thinking of, you know, what is every question, desire, pain point, frustration? And instead of making it all about ourselves and giving us the power and being like, hey, we're the best and we can help you solve this. How, do, how about we talk about that in the context of the customer? Yeah. Right. So less eyes and we's and more use, more like how this is going to help you. Hey, you're, you're, you're suffering. You've been in an accident. Like you need a, a lawyer that understands personal injury. You need a lawyer that understands these things as opposed to being like, hi, we're the XX law firm and we can help you with personal injury. And by the way, we do car accidents and this and that. It's like, great. Like everyone does that, right? Yeah. How do we really speak to these, these users and make them the hero of the story instead of ourselves? And if you do all those like three to four things, you'll really find um, people will spend longer amounts of time on the site. They'll engage with your brand more. You'll have a higher conversion rate. You should see more rankings in Google for your keywords should start to expand, right? You start moving up yeah. and you just keep kind of running through those ideas, keep running through, you know, questions as, as questions and market data comes in, like actual data from real clients or prospective clients comes in. Like, how can we incorporate that into the site to use as more of a sales tool and really yeah. educate them? So by the time they're coming to you, it's like, they already know your business. They know what you offer. They know your values. They, they really just want to learn how, you know, which package they should get in or how they can get started. And, and it's all kind of contextualized to, to what you've said on the website, which makes it an easier close. Yeah. Yeah. So when you've got, I like what you said about the, you know, starting out with more, I guess, traditional marketing and what are the questions that you're hearing in real life from your clients and that sort of thing. So when people go through that ideation process, are you having them, are they sort of just creating blog posts on each one of those? Like does each one become a blog post and you, you answer that in a question or is this sort of, um, or are you doing it some other way? Like, are they building out like a full content plan where they're going to have X number of new pieces of content that they add to their site? Is that what they do next? So that's a fantastic question. I'd say there's, there's two quick things you can do. You can plug those questions in SEM rush and then see, right. You can also, there's a questions feature. So if you're like wanting to rank for a certain term, you hit questions, it'll show you the questions that they know of that people ask It's not always as good as going straight to the source of your client, right? From there, you can decide whether it's, you know, some topics can be comprehensively covered in a few sentences or a few statements that could be like an FAQ that you just add to the bottom of your service page, or you incorporate somewhere within the like AIDA framework, whatever kind of framework you're using to write your content, you can include that in there. If it's, if it's something that can be more comprehensive and isn't a service, like I separate it into two levels, like it's either a service, like people want to buy, they want to, you know, move forward on, on something or they're in the discovery phase. If it's discovery, I typically do that as a blog post. So you're, you're driving different types of traffic. You don't just want all, I mean, everyone just wants people that buy, right. But like inherently someone that reads a blog post about you, you're giving them that, that information, you're the source of water in the desert. Guess what happens when they're thirsty again, they're going to come back to you. Right. Okay. Or you can get crafty with a, a very efficient, inexpensive retargeting campaign Right. It can take people up to seven times to engage with your business, and actually opt in. Right. And yes. so you're kind of playing both sides of the field of like, yeah, we want to help educate and give value our, to our community. And granted, a lot of people that come in on blog posts might not be qualified buyers. Some will. And then you have your service based content where maybe the question is can be more succinct, like, 
hey, what is shipping like? Or how do I return this? Or what is the policy for a late appointment or whatever it is where you can maybe have that in a in a service specific page or on an FAQ section where it doesn't need its own blog post. You just kind of have to make the decision of like knowing um, what kind of comprehensiveness that the question has. And if it's shorter, just put it as an FAQ. If it's longer, blog post is great. Gotcha. Okay. So talk to me a little bit about, uh, we, you mentioned link building is one of the things um, that's been, you know, a part of the SEO picture for a long time. Um, there's varying opinions out there on how important it is and whether you should spend a lot of time on it, or if, if it's just one of those things that kind of occurs naturally as you build good content. Um, where do you stand on that? And then what sort of link building do you see that works consistently for your clients? Or do you have any um, favorite kind of go-to link building strategies that you could share? Certainly. So, so, I mean, we, we're all about relationship building, right? So we have relationships with over 5,000 sites over the years, you know, you just keep adding more and more. So a lot of it is outreach, right? You can reach out to communities, reach out to people that you know would be interested in this content, just try to add value. You can oftentimes get backlinks without having to, you know, send out a, you know, dozens and dozens of emails if you're just going for the right groups and the right people at these groups. So outreach is a huge component, whether that's, you know, you doing it yourself or getting a VA to help you, or I think personal touch is always better. I think going for communities and really making connection with people is one of the better ways to build backlinks. Um, obviously, as you, your content gets shared more, uh, you know, I put on social media, I post in social media groups, right? There's a lot of social sharing backlinks that you can get. Right. Of course, everyone in their their mother's probably got an email from someone saying, hey, I can sell you this backlink on this site. Right. Like, mm -hmm. that's great. I stay away from that stuff. Uh, I think, you know, you have to you have to be very strategic in the types of links that you build and the quality of those links. And so I think outreach is a great place. I think forms are a great place. So you can hop on a form, add some consistent value, share articles. If people are actually, if you're writing valuable content, people will respond to it. They will engage with it. They will share it. They might put it on social. They might put it on their own blog, right? There's also sure. competitor backlink scraping where you can look at competitors, see where they've lost backlinks, or maybe, you know, Ahrefs has a, a video on this on their blog, right? Like going and finding sites that have broken links and saying like, Hey, notice this link is broken. Think our site would be a great resource for your user base, right? There's a, yeah. a lot to be done there. Of course, your web 2.0s, your mediums, a lot of, some of them are no follow. That's okay. Google still counts those backlinks. And if you're contributing valuable content, you know, inherently you're going to get some shares and some engagement. I would not, I would not, uh, I, I want to underline that a little bit of like web 2.0s are a great place to start. Um, outside of that, you know, we've got outreach, we've got social sharing, you know, trying to kind of your traditional uh, uh, kind of classic SEO stuff. I think message boards are a really great place. I think core is a great place, right? Like trying to find um, niche backlinks, I'd say would be like the most important uh, process, part of the process of like, it's not just about getting the backlink. Google's engine rank brain kind of understands the context of that backlink. So if you're just getting on some like social bookmarking site like that, isn't enough anymore, right? Like, yeah. yeah, you'll get a backlink from it. Is that really from a community that like has a lot of authority? No. Is it a community that people really trust? No. So like get rid of all the like chintzy stuff and just, it's not always about quantity, it's about quality. And so you got to start there. If you start there, your backlink profile is going to be concise, right? Yeah. If you're just going out and building, you know, there's people out there on Fiverr, there's all kinds of stuff. Oh, I'll, I'll boost your domain authority and Sometimes there's a gem or two in there, but by and large, just from what I've seen with other guys and gals in the industry, like you really want to focus on more of the heart to heart, face to face, look at your competitors, backlinks, use some tools to uncover opportunities where you can add value and reach out. You can just reach out sending, you know, sending different, you know, of course there's guest posting and other things that you can do. That's um, sending articles to people and effectively, um, trying to add value to their communities, which, you know, you can have some levels of success with. It's really just uh, thinking about what types of backlinks would differentiate you. So I like to start with citations. I think citations for a small business um, are one of the most important things you can do. There is a caveat. You do need to have a physical office space or Google business location to do that. 
Um, those are quality backlinks. They may not have, you know, the super relevant contextual, like niche down approach that something like an outreach would provide. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's about creating that solid foundation and, you know, getting, taking kind of that omni-channel approach, like forms, message boards, social media, outreach, guest posting, um, you know, how, how do we get some PR? How do we get, you know, maybe a news story pod, you know, podcasts get backlinks as well. Right. So there's all sure. kinds of, um, different opportunities that you can do with backlinking. I'd say what's working, uh, really well for us right now is we're doing a lot of outreach, a lot of manual outreach. We're doing a lot of, um, kind of like brand collaborations, trying to, you know, tie together communities, uh, and just leading with value, like give someone something before you just ask for the backlink. And the, the, the easiest way to think of it is even with looking through like Ahrefs and looking at broken links that have your competitors used to have backlinks for like in a way that's adding value, like sites that have 404s and have broken links on them don't rank as well. So yeah. likely that site's seeing an impact too. It's not just the site that we're linking to. So yeah, there's plenty of opportunities to, you know, I've seen people go as far as to audit content. They're like, Hey, I loved your site. I noticed you had some errors over here, right? Just leave with some value, think outside the box, reach out to your communities. Um, and, and don't think of it as a, a, an approach that you just need to, you know, go buy a backlink package from someone. There's a, there's a lot right. more that you can be doing to, to move the needle. And, and you'll find that in doing the work, you'll actually, regardless of what the domain authority is or trust flow and all these metrics, you actually see that the niche backlinks work really, really well. Okay. So it sounds like relevance is maybe one of the, the key words, staying tight in your niche, that that's more valuable than just sort of a generic link. So when you are um, setting up like a manual outreach campaign with a client, are you guys creating content that would be like, a link magnet or whatever you want to call it that you think is going to be something outreach worthy. Like uh, I've heard of like the skyscraper technique where you try to create this really, you know, epic piece of content and, and that sort of thing. Like, are you starting with that? Or like, what are you, when you're approaching people with manual outreach, like, what are you asking them for? Like, Hey, will you include us on this page or, Hey, I want to let you know, we just published this and that sort of thing. Like what, What's kind of typically your pitch that you're you're leading with? So our, our pitch is pretty simple. It's it's hey, we want to add some value. Here's five to ten topics that we think would be fantastic for your user base. Um, what are your thoughts? That's it. We're not really asking for, um, you know, there's sometimes where it's like, hey, would you mind sharing this blog? We're going to put some links in here. You can be transparent about it, but it's not just like most people are like, hey we want a backlink for this post. Like I get these, right. all, those all the time and it's like, okay, yeah. great. But what if you actually had like 10 topics that people really wanted to know about? Right. And it's like, yeah. whoa, you guys don't have this on your site. I'd love to add this value. It's going to be well-written. We'll tell them how many, you know, Hey, we're going to write you like a comprehensive article that has some quality to it. Uh, it's not just a guest post, like fluffy article. It's, and, and that's to everyone's benefit, right? Like you want yeah. that content to be shared because then that backlink might be twice as powerful after people share the article that you guest posted on, right? So there's all these, these different ways. And then sometimes you don't even have to do an article. Like there's infographics, there's video. I mean, there's so many different things that you can, different mediums that you can add to um, differentiate yourself, right? We did one for a residential treatment center. We did an infographic um, for a, a very specific niche within that, you know, uh, treatment, it was like an LGBT, um, service, you know, the a service offered specifically, I believe to transgenders and people experiencing, you know, gender dysphoria and, and created an infographic and reached out to some communities that were like, wow, this is great. Right. And we put that in a blog, we put the infographic on a blog on the website. And now people are linking back to that infographic and that link and, there's other sites that you can share infographics on and really just yeah. like, how do we just add some value? And it doesn't have to be a, a 2000 word article. It could be a, a really cool infographic or a white paper or, uh, Hey, don't forget to right do this kind of checklist kind of thing. So there's, there's a lot of different ways you can get creative and I encourage you to just think about like what you think your users would want. Yeah. 
Okay, very cool. Um, so as we're starting to wind down here a little bit, um, we talked a little bit about link building. We talked about content, um, keywords a little bit. Anything else kind of in the SEO uh, toolbox that you've got that you've seen that's really producing results for you and your clients um, in 2021? It just seems to really be moving the needle that you think would be time well spent for folks. I think it's it's definitely check out the keyword research tool, uh, keyword magic tool if you're using SDM Rush and questions tab. Covering those questions actually helps. Google's looking for high levels of main content and supporting content. And so those blogs, while they may be, you might consider main content, they're supporting your services, they're supporting your sales process, and they're driving new users to your site. So if there's one opportunity is don't go straight for, you know, don't ask the person out on the date until you've talked to them for five minutes, right? Like give people a little bit of context around some of these discovery-based terms. Think about how you can really add value. That's going to actually help you rank for your core terms, whether you know it or not. So that's number one. Number two is take a look at your page speed. It's not always about adding more leads to the top of the funnel, right? Of course, we all want to increase traffic. We all want that exponential growth and, and you'll get there doing the, the things that we talked about on this, this podcast today. Uh, and I'm sure you're already having results for yourselves in many of these areas. One statistic that's out there is, you know, a site that loads under five seconds statistically has like an expert in some cases, I think it's can double conversion rates. So core web vitals updates coming out. There's a lot of people that are jumping off the ledge with this thing. I don't think you need to go crazy, but take a look at your page speed, hire a great contractor, hire a firm to help you with, you know, getting your speed optimized. That is not only going to help you with your rankings, it's going to help you with your traffic. And it's more importantly, aside from adding any new leads to the top of the funnel, it's going to help you better convert the leads that you have. So yeah. that would be my, my tippy top priorities for you guys. Very cool. You got, just curious, you got anybody that you recommend uh, for that? You mentioned, you know, hiring in out. I feel like a lot of people, myself included, uh, when it comes to like speed optimization, you can, your head can start spinning very quickly. Um, I don't know. Is that something that you do? <laughs> Is that no. something that you guys do? Or do you have any other uh, contractors or people that you sort of go to or, or would refer people to that, that want to get into the cool web vital stuff and, and look at their site speed? So we've actually got an in-house team that handles page speed optimizations left and right. Like a good score that you should shoot for on mobile would be like a 60 or 70 on desktop. You should be able to get like 90 to a hundred. Okay. Um, if you're, you're interested and you need some page speed, you can check us out at peaksdigitalmarketing.com. I uh, filled a contact form. We've got a team that can turn it around in a, in a week, week and a half, two weeks and get your speed really improved. It does depend on sometimes there's some limitations with themes and websites. So you know, it's a case by case basis. That said, there's not a lot of barriers to entry on the page speed stuff. I definitely encourage you to check that out. If you're more of a do it yourselfer and you want to try to take a shot at page speed, there's some plugins that you can take a look at. Auto optimize is one plugin and WP rocket is another. Um, I think there's image if I, or image. It's like image. If I is also like an image optimization plugin that works really well. Um, okay many cases you're like changing the loading order of the site and the code and how things behave on the back end while preserving the look and feel of the site on the front end. So full disclaimer, you can break your site with these tools. It can actually <laughs> cause some serious problems. So start small, ask for help when you need it. We're here to support you. There's a lot of resources online as well that can kind of walk you through how to set up some of the less advanced, less risky features in some of those softwares. Um, and inherently, you know, there's there's quite a few uh, contractors and things out there that you could probably find on on Upwork as well if you're looking for uh, for some page speed stuff. You just have to be careful. You're giving th that individual or, or that firm the keys to your website temporarily. Like they're going to need your server dashboard. They're going to need, in some cases, your domain registrar. They're going to need, you know, FTP access. Like you're basically giving that person root access. So it's it's important not to maybe like be careful with just hiring any person to do that on Upwork because it's you don't want to be sending your credentials over open airwaves and having you know some kind of issue happen or uh, I'm, generally people are pretty good right but there's yeah. there's a lot of detail that you need to uh, pay attention to when uh, and have someone that you trust do it sure someone yeah, has some good ratings sense. at least yeah would you recommend doing it on a staging site first if you've got access to create a staging site if somebody's going to try to DIY this thing. Probably do it on staging and then 
make sure you don't break something first. <laughs> don't do it on the live site. Whatever you do, don't do it on the live site, please. Uh, right. You'll you'll kick yourself for it. Um, and and if you don't have a staging site, you know, you can hire a webmaster to set set one up. It's not super hard to set one up. Uh, just about every it's very rare that someone says just do it on the live site. And if we do, we actually pull the website down to a local host, edit it, and then upload it after it's been been done. So you could also pull it down. That's it's a bit more advanced. Just see yeah. if you can get a staging site set up and fan, that's like one of the best pieces of advice that we needed to include in that statement. So I appreciate that. Yeah, cool. Okay. All right. Well, uh, hey, I appreciate the time, man. If people want to, uh, you know, follow along with you, get in touch with you, um, anything like that, uh, where, where can they find you and any just kind of final things you wanted to say? I, I appreciate the the opportunity. Um, if you want to check us out, you know, go to peaks, P-E-A-K-S, digitalmarketing.com, or you can find me on social media, uh, David A. Finberg on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Um, and yeah, had a, had a great time on the show and uh, appreciate the platform and opportunity and uh, look for it next time. All right, man. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much.